Here's a weird question. What is Little Women? Now, you might reasonably think that this is a question with an obvious answer. Little Women, you might say, is a coming-of-age story for children written between 1868 and 1869 and one of the foundational texts of children's literature as we know it today. Or, Little Women is a 1994 period drama starring Winona Ryder, which received several prestigious Academy Award nominations and has gone down in history as a beloved millennial classic. Or, Little Women is a stage musical, which opened on Broadway in 2005, followed that up with a US tour the same year, and then just sort of died for a while before opening off West End in London just last year. Me and a couple of my friends went to see it, actually. It was a lot of fun. Or, Little Women is... Do, do you see where I'm going with this? Little Women may once have just been a novel, but it's one of those works that's been adapted and retold and reimagined so much that it now transcends what it once was. Greta Gerwig, director of the latest major adaptation, actually backs me up on this. In multiple interviews, she discusses how she was influenced by this idea of the urtext of Little Women, almost a greater Little Women canon that transcends any one version, one where every version is the true version and none of them are, all at the same time. It reminds me a little of Patricia Taxon's video, Is Art a Commodity, which argues, among other things, that because art is so dependent on its context, the nature of a work of art immediately starts changing from the second it's created and released into the world. I think that idea is true of basically any piece of art. I feel like this is what we talk about when we talk about a movie or book not aging well, but it seems especially true of something like Little Women. It's not just that the context around the book has changed since it was published in 1869, but Little Women itself has changed through the process of retelling and reiteration. Kind of like how in time loop movies the characters can change the events of the same day as they repeat it over and over. The book has been in the public domain for almost 100 years now, predating even the first major adaptation of it in 1933. This means that everyone who's written an adaptation or retelling of Little Women in the past 100 years has been free to put their own spin on it, without having to bend to the whims of whoever owns the rights. With Little Women so popular, and crucially, thanks to the public domain, so easy to adapt, discussing this story almost by necessity leads us into discussing the process of adaptation itself, and where the impulse to retell stories like Little Women comes from. It's just one of many stories that get this treatment. This desire to retell and reiterate also crops up with many stories from ancient mythology, the works of Shakespeare, and the most adapted character himself, Sherlock Holmes, among others. On the face of it, the fact that retelling the same stories over and over again has such an appeal to us seems counterintuitive. Don't we crave originality in new stories? So what is the appeal of art in iteration? What is the value of retelling old stories? What keeps these works alive in the cultural consciousness? What does it mean? What does it all mean? Maybe digging deeper into Little Women and how it's been adapted and retold over the years will lend us some insight. Now, before we can get into the weeds of Little Women adaptations, of which there are... so many, we need to talk about the springboard from which all later Little Women's craft their narrative, the original book. And in particular, we need to talk about the ending. So, for those of you who've never had the pleasure of experiencing Little Women in any of its many forms, here's a quick synopsis. Little Women tells the story of the four March sisters, Meg, Beth, Amy, and protagonist Joe. The first half follows a year of the sisters' childhood during the American Civil War, while their father is away serving as a chaplain in the Union Army. They meet their rich new neighbour Laurie, who quickly becomes BFFs of Joe, and they deal with various relatable teenage problems. For the most part, it's a nice, fun, light-hearted slice of life story. Part two, in contrast, is all about the sisters growing up to adulthood, and it's where most of the book's more dramatic events happen. Amy travels to Europe with the sister's rich aunt with the intention of learning to paint, only to have her artistic ambitions completely crushed. Laurie proposes to Joe, who is resolved to never marry and doesn't return his feelings anyway, and it breaks both of their hearts. Beth dies of complications from the scarlet fever she contracted as a kid. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you, man. Old children's books could be real fucking downers. And Joe... Joe... Outcast, irrepressible tomboy, determined never to marry since she was at least 15... She tries. God, she tries. She tries to become a successful writer and support her family, but none of her attempts amount to much, and in the end she puts her writing aside for a while and gets married to a professor she meets in New York. And that is how it ends. Okay, I'm making it sound a lot bleaker than it actually is. In the book itself, the tone of the ending is a lot more upbeat, if still a little on the melancholy side. But I don't think I'd be making some revolutionary new hot take to say that it's kind of a weird ending. Like, there's so much stuff throughout the story about Jo hating the role society expects her to fit into because of her gender, and never wanting to get married or live life in the traditional way, and her having to fight back against society because of that. And then, in the end, she just marries this kind of random guy who appears in the book for only a couple of chapters, and basically ends up filling the role she always hated. 
That's a pretty weird way for a love story in a book to play out. And I didn't even mention how after Laurie's proposal to Joe fails, he gets married to her younger sister Amy, someone he's known since she was 12 and he was 16, and like, no shade meant to my favourite controversial classic lit couple, but if those are people you knew in real life and weren't like privy to the inner thoughts of through the novel medium, that would just be intervention-worthy behaviour. And again, just a very strange way for a romantic arc in a book to play out. But here's where it starts to get complicated, because yes, in a lot of ways this ending is weird and unsatisfying and feels a bit out of nowhere, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, at least not in terms of the novel's legacy. Let's be honest with ourselves here, people kind of love unsatisfying endings, they love complaining about them, they love writing pointless online petitions about them, they love pretending they didn't happen but doing it really loudly so everyone knows how much they didn't like the ending, and most of all, they love making big claims about how they'd fix it if they were in charge. And I'm not trying to act above it all here, I'm absolutely including myself in this. Do you know how long ago How I Met Your Mother ended? It's been like eight years, I should not care anymore, but if a video dunking on the finale of that show pops up in my YouTube recommendations, I will not hesitate to click on it. Now, to be clear, there's a huge gap in quality between Little Women and How I Met Your Mother, but it's the same basic principle. When a piece of media that people love and have a lot of emotional investment in ends in a way that doesn't satisfy that investment, people's immediate instinct will often be to try and figure out how to fix it. I'm definitely not saying that the continual obsession with adapting and retelling Little Women can 100% be attributed to this weird unsatisfying ending, but I do think it plays a more important role than people might expect. I mean, for one thing, the ending of Little Women is part of what makes it unique. It's so easy to imagine a more conventional, less interesting version of the book, taking the obvious route and having Joe and Laurie end up together. That's what fans back in the 1860s were all clamouring for, after all. But it's not a book that takes easy, obvious routes. It has a vision, and it sticks to it. It challenges the reader to question what they expect from the characters. And despite the bitching, I think that we as a society still appreciate that. It's always neat when art subverts our expectations and sticks to its gun in the face of fan demand. Sure, there might have been a way for it to subvert expectations and still feel more narratively satisfying, we'll get to that, but again, that's where the instinct to retell it comes in. Perhaps we insist on retelling Little Women in a vain hope that if we repeat it enough, we might be able to change the ending into something we like more. And say what you will about the definition of insanity, but we've certainly tried. The comparison to time loop movies once again feels apt. Just as the titular character in Run Lola Run tries over and over again to save her boyfriend's life, so the writers and directors of the world try over and over again to create a Little Women ending that will satisfy them and their audience. I'd say the 1994 film is the one that comes closest to making the ending satisfying, while still maintaining the basic narrative structure of the novel. It actually fleshes out the relationship between Joe and Professor Bayer and sets them up as intellectual equals, so them getting together at the end feels more believable. Joe's aspirations to become a great author also get more focus, and instead of her seemingly giving up on her ambition, the film gives her an arguably more fulfilling ending and has her publish a book based on her life and family, Little Women. I mean, if we want to talk repetition, that's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down. This collapsing of the space between character and author actually dates back to the first major film adaptation in 1933, and it went on to be hugely influential on all the following Little Women adaptations. You'd be hard pressed to find an adaptation that doesn't include something along those lines. This brings us back to the idea of the Urtext, or Greater Canon, a canon which we here see being subtly rewritten by the influence of the 1933 film. However, for all its influence and beloved status, the 1994 film is still not a perfect attempt at squaring the problems people have historically had with the ending of the book. It makes some attempt at fleshing out why Amy and Laurie get together, but not much. The scenes in Europe do little to illuminate why these two would have a connection, and the attempts at foreshadowing the relationship mainly manifested this fucking mind-bogglingly awkward scene where a 20-year-old Christian Bale offers to kiss a 12-year-old. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's one of the worst things I've ever seen, but that's only because the modernised 2018 film adaptation also did this scene, but with Laurie played by 34-year-old Lucas Grabeel. <sighs> God, I'm getting flashbacks to when Xander and Dawn ended up dating in the Buffy comics, which we don't talk about. In fact, forget I even brought it up here, I don't read comics, what's Buffy? I think she kills werewolves or something? So as you can probably guess, the 2018 film is a hot mess, but it is interesting. Goody goody Maggie March, who let you out of the hen house? Drink, 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 drink! <laughs> Like the 1994 film, you can tell how concerned the creators are with selling the romance between Joe and Bea and making it work for the audience, but unlike in the 1994 film, they… 
um, well, A failed wildly, and B didn't seem to be concerned with literally anything else. Not the other sisters, and certainly not any of the social commentary that can be drawn out of the book. Which is a shame, because it's obvious from reading Little Women that author Louisa May Alcott had a lot to say about social responsibility, class, gender, and all sorts of other social issues that continue to be relevant today. A modern day retelling of Little Women has a lot of potential to comment on how things have changed or stayed the same since the 19th century. As Julie Sanders argued in her excellent book, Adaptation and Appropriation, one of the things that makes adaptations of classics powerful is their potential to communicate ideas through a shared literary language, and this film's biggest crime is having absolutely no ideas to communicate. At a certain point, the 2018 film even gives up on trying to make the ending work. Its idea of dealing with the fact that Amy and Laurie ending up together is a decision which many find baffling is just to skip over the development of their relationship entirely, and it's in good company in that respect. It's the same tactic that the first two surviving film adaptations in 1933 and 1949 went with. The 1933 film was kind of fascinating in terms of its attitude to the ending, actually. If I had to sum up the tone of this adaptation in one word, it would be self-aware. The film has no illusions about whether or not the audience will be satisfied with how its romantic arcs play out. It knows that its ending doesn't really make any sense, it just doesn't care. Like, look at Catherine Hepburn awkwardly patting poor Lucas on the shoulder, they knew what they were doing here. There's many, many more Little Women adaptations out there, and they all handle the ending slightly differently, but that isn't the only thing that sets them apart, or even the main thing. The biggest distinguishing feature between them is the themes and emotions that they explore. The canon of Little Women adaptations provides a wonderful microcosm of the power of adaptation, and how different approaches to the same source material can result in wildly different but equally valid and worthy pieces of the art. Well, maybe maybe the 2018 film isn't valid. So the new kid has a manny. Over the past 150 years of iteration, Little Women has been a story about growing up and overcoming your inner demons, a love story, a tale of artistic ambition, a celebration of sisterhood, a drama about how women survive in a system that limits them, and so much more. But for all that Little Women has been retold over the years, and for all that these different retellings have had their own spin on the story, the basic events still remain the same. It really is like a time loop, one that starts with four sisters together at Christmas, and ends with the sisters all either married or dead. Put a pin in that comment! No difference in themes, or which scenes from the book are included, or what additions are made, can change that base narrative. That seems a bit paradoxical, considering my argument that part of the reason this story remains in the collective consciousness is not in spite of, but because of people not liking the ending. But then again, changing the ending is also kind of a bold choice that most adapters probably aren't prepared to commit to. And it's a bit less fun, isn't it? Like, any schmuck can change an unsatisfying ending to something different, it takes a true artiste to take that same ending and make it satisfying. So instead, the loop goes round and round again, with what essentially amount to minor changes. The actors become more age-appropriate, the focus on different themes changes, at some point someone tries relocating the events to modern day, which would probably be super interesting if it was done by competent people, but I guess we can't have everything in this life. But here's the thing about art and iteration. The more you repeat something, the further it gets from the original. Have you ever played the knockoff mode of Gartic Phone? It's a game where you and your friends all draw something, and then the drawings are passed on to the next person. The next person has to memorise the drawing they get and copy it down, and the amount of time to draw gets shorter each time. By the end you're left with a weird, distorted version of the original drawing, or possibly something completely different depending on how badly someone fucked up along the way. This is just like that, just without the time limit or memorisation. The structure can't hold together forever, eventually you get something like the 2019 film. There's a lot to talk about with the 2019 film. Hell, I've already made a whole 15 minute video about just one theme of the film which I find interesting, but the TLDR of it is that it's a really radical reimagining. The structure is completely rewritten to make it a non-chronological narrative, and the framing of the story and emotion that evokes are very distinct from most other versions. The theme that explores are also very different to its predecessors, with far more focus on ideas of nostalgia and artistic ambition that aren't even addressed at all in some adaptations. It's a wildly different iteration, as if the characters have finally hit the point in the time loop movie where they get sick of the routine and just completely go over the edge, doing weird unexpected shit like stealing a groundhog and driving off a cliff. Obviously, not everyone is going to like every single one of the adaptations out there, especially not interpretations that are as radical and different as the 2019 film adaptation. And let's get one thing straight, I'm not saying that you have to. People are allowed to not like certain takes on their favourite works. For example, I, for the most part, really enjoyed Steven Spielberg's remake of West Side Story last year. Okay, fine, who am I kidding? I lost my fucking mind over Spielberg's remake of West Side Story. Did you see the, did you see the choreography? That shit was insane! 
but I did take some issues with how much grimmer and more serious the tone was in comparison to the 1961 film. It was, you know, definitely better executed than certain other attempts at bringing dark and gritty musicals to the screen. Hi, Tom. But I still felt that in removing some of the musical's more light-hearted or silly moments, such as the fake wedding in the dress shop, the story lost some of the poignancy and emotional impact that the original created by contrasting those moments with the story's tragic ending. However, I would not then move on from that to argue that the 2021 film must have been trying to achieve a similar tone to the original and simply failed, because that's clearly not what's happening here. And I find it equally short-sighted when people treat the 2019 adaptation of Little Women as Greta Gerwig failing to understand the book, and not being willing to entertain the notion that, like, she does understand the book but just has her own interpretation of the characters and story that don't necessarily match up 100% with Alcott's original intent, to whatever extent we can even know what that intent was. You can't straight up refuse to engage with a piece of art on its own terms and then act like that makes it objectively bad. You're allowed to dislike certain interpretations of a source material, but it seems weak to me to only articulate that in terms of the interpretation being different from the original, without interrogating why that difference is there and what its impact is on your experience as a consumer of art. Even if we accept that there could be some value to judging based on faithfulness to an original text when it comes to recent source materials, which only have one or two adaptations, it seems especially pointless to argue along these lines of something like Little Women, which has been adapted and retold hundreds of times and had these different adaptations and retellings feed into each other. The 2019 film is so far removed from the original book, not just by time but also by number of iterations, that comparing them directly seems like a fool's errand. The idea of faithfulness to the original simply isn't a framework that works in this case, and instead I think it would be much more productive to discuss it in the same way we might discuss different versions and reinterpretations of mythology or folklore. Though speaking of mythology… Compared to retellings and reiterations of recent works like Little Women, retellings of myths tend to have a lot more variety. In the grand scheme of, uh, the entire history of culture, classic novels like Little Women really aren't that old. They haven't actually had much time to evolve. Certainly not compared to some of our older stories, such as the ancient Greek myths, which also have the advantage of existing before copyright law and so have always been free to be retold by anyone who fancies it. So what does the iteration of art look like when it's allowed to blossom over thousands of years? Well, to pick an example completely at random that in no way connects to a specific piece of media I've been really into lately that also happens to invoke the very same ideas about art I've been discussing here, it looks a lot like what we've done with the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Okay, I know I spent an insufferably long time retelling the plot of Little Women, but from the perspective of someone who hates the existence of romance in fiction, but I really need to give a brief summary of the myth for folks in the audience who haven't brushed up on their Greek mythology knowledge lately. I promise it'll be quick, it's not a very long story, and I won't be doing my weird cynical shtick this time around, because it turns out I actually do like romance in fiction, just only when it's sad. Unlike Little Women, we can't really say there's an original version of the myth, but the general story goes like this. Orpheus is an amazing musician who is overcome by grief after the death of his wife Eurydice. Unwilling to accept her death, he descends to the underworld to try to bargain with Hades, god of the dead, to return her to life. He plays his lyre and sings for Hades, who is so moved by his music that he agrees to let Eurydice go under one condition. Orpheus must lead Eurydice back up to the world of the living, but is not allowed to turn around to look back at her. If he does, she will be sent back to the underworld, gone forever. Orpheus is confident that he will be able to do this, but during the walk out of the underworld, he is overcome by doubt that Eurydice is still following him. He turns around, seeing Eurydice one last time before she is sent back to her death permanently. And that is how it ends. Orpheus and Eurydice is one of the most enduring of the classical myths, adapted so many times that my bestie Julie Sanders' book had to have a whole subsection just on so-called Orphic narratives. When we look at classical versions of the myth, the unique qualities of art and iteration immediately become evident. One of the earliest surviving retellings of the Orpheus and Eurydice myth can be found in Plato's Symposium, written in around 380 BC. Symposium is a philosophical text in which a group of friends have a competition to see who can give the best speech on the subject of love. The speeches cover a variety of topics, from what makes the best kind of relationship to what the nature of love itself is. In one of these speeches, the character Phaedrus actually brings up the myth as a negative example of a relationship. He argues that the reason things don't work out for Orpheus is because Orpheus' actions are those of a coward. If his love were true, he'd just kill himself to be with Eurydice instead of trying to cheat death. Which… I mean, that's a take, Plato. <laughs> It stands in contrast to the more romantic portrayal of the myth in other classical works, such as Ovid's retelling in his epic poem Metamorphoses, written nearly 400 years after the symposium. In comparison to Plato's cynicism, Ovid takes a far more idealistic approach, to the point that he even gives Orpheus and Eurydice a happy ending of sorts. After describing their failed escape, the Metamorphoses moves on to tell the story of Orpheus' own untimely death. 
Overcome by the grief of losing Eurydice yet again, Orpheus rejects the company of other women and goes to sit in the forest, singing to the animals and plants. A group of the women Orpheus rejected run into him in the forest, and unfortunately for the poor guy, these women also just so happen to be followers of Dionysus, which means that their main hobby is going into a state of frenzy and literally tearing apart men they don't like. So Orpheus is brutally killed, and his spirit, like that of so many Greek heroes, travels to the Elysian Fields, basically the closest thing to the Christian idea of heaven you'll see in Greek mythology, and is reunited as the spirit of Eurydice. Ovid, ever the hopeless romantic, ends his tale of Orpheus and Eurydice like this. There hand in hand they stroll, the two together. Sometimes he follows as she walks in front, sometimes he goes ahead and gazes back, no danger now, at his Eurydice. Considering the tragic nature of Orpheus and Eurydice's story, it's by far the happiest ending you could imagine for them. Hell, you could even call it a little bit sappy, but there's still an underlying darkness to the story. The pain that drives Orpheus to travel to the underworld for Eurydice and the unbearable grief he experiences after her second death are still central. As well as being a romantic tragedy, it also still functions as a warning against the dangers of hubris, an ancient Greek concept typically used to refer to mortals who went against the gods. Orpheus' efforts to undo death can be considered a classic example of hubris, and as is typical of Greek tragedy, he is harshly punished for it. In the thousands of years since classical writers like Ovid, interpretations and retellings of the story have become even more diverse and further removed from the original. I have no way of even counting how many there are, but I can only assume the number is in the thousands. I'm not going to be able to talk about even a fraction of them, but some of the most notable and interesting adaptations in recent years include Moulin Rouge, a musical directed by Baz Luhrmann, which replaces the literal underworld with a metaphorical underworld of corruption, and the King of the Dead with an evil duke who ensnares the film's Eurydice analogue. The Song of Orpheus story in Neil Gaiman's Sandman comic, which I most mostly think is worth mentioning because it makes Orpheus the son of the comic's main character, whose name is Morpheus. The Mechanisms album Ulysses Dies at Dawn, which retells various different Greek myths in a dystopian sci-fi setting, including Orpheus as a young musician who gets involved in a criminal gang to try to raise money to buy Eurydice's freedom from a digital afterlife and have her reborn in a new body. Hades, the video game where you play as Hades' son Zagreus trying to escape the underworld and can, if you feel like it, reunite Orpheus and Eurydice and then they can sing together, which is adorable. And these adaptations are only part of the story. There's also what Julie Sanders calls appropriations, works that don't directly adapt the myth, but use it as a kind of common reference point with the audience to convey certain ideas. These include films like Portrait of a Lady on Fire and paintings like The Kiss. And even beyond direct references, there's plenty of stories that could be argued were inspired more indirectly by the Orpheus and Eurydice myth, perhaps even unconsciously. You can really make that argument about any story involving a journey to the world of the dead or the theme of trying to cheat death, such as Philip Pullman's fantasy novel The Amber Spyglass. That book even includes the protagonists leading a bunch of dead people out of the afterlife. Would you look at that? Looking at even a small sample of the works that have adapted, appropriated, referenced, or taken inspiration from Orpheus and Eurydice, two things become clear. One is that while the basic story remains fairly consistent, these works often have basically nothing in common when it comes to the details. The story of Moulin Rouge, which is based in a real-world setting, and the story of the fantasy game Hades are about as different as chalk and cheese, and all of them have vast differences from any classical version of the myth, whether it's the different settings in Moulin Rouge and Ulysses Dies at Dawn, or the inclusion of new characters from the Sandman comics. It's an illustrative example of where retelling certain stories gets us in the end. It's inevitable that through the process of iteration, we eventually end up with this exact kind of chaotic diversity. Instead of what we see with different adaptations of Little Women, where there are minor changes between different versions, but they still have more in common than not, we get this big soup of different retellings influencing each other, and everyone's ideas and interpretations and sensibilities merging together and turning into something completely new. And classics like Little Women are getting there, don't get me wrong, but it's still a long way to go. Am I implying that the next logical step is for someone to write some kind of dystopian sci-fi version of Little Women? Maybe? Like, my gut reaction is that that sounds completely terrible, but I would be curious how you'd go about it. But the other thing that becomes clear is that, much like with Little Women, the ending remains the same. Orpheus always fails. Even in the game Hades, which, like the Metamorphoses, does grant something close to a happy ending to Orpheus and Eurydice, that's set after Orpheus has already looked back and condemned Eurydice to an eternity in the underworld. They don't get to leave, instead they just get to be stuck in the underworld together. It is, once again, a time loop. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy fights to get girl back, boy fails. Rinse and repeat with different aesthetics and characters and plot details each time. And once again, it raises the question, why? Why must this story always end the same way, so cruelly? Well, remember what I said about the nature of a given piece of art changing with time? That applies to Orpheus and Eurydice as well. 
Once upon a time, the source of the tragedy might have been Orpheus's hubris, or the cruelty of how close the young lovers come to doing the impossible, but now I think the nature of the tragedy is different. The repetition is the point. The most tragic thing of all is how many times they try and fail. No matter how many times we tell the story, how many times we sing the song, you might say, it never turns out any different. But we sing it anyway. So, yeah. I've been dancing around it, but you probably knew where this discussion was leading. I wasn't exactly going to make a video about the impulse to retell the same stories over and over again that references the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, and not talk about Hades Town. Hades Town is yet another retelling of the myth, this time in stage musical form, which naturally makes it my favourite. It reimagines the myth with a distinctly anti capitalist spin. Instead of being the literal god of the dead, Hades is the boss of the titular dystopian factory town, where the wage is nothing and the work is hard. Eurydice, driven to desperation by poverty, agrees to work for Hades, and Orpheus travels to Hades town to try to break her contract, bring her home, and sing a song so beautiful it will make Hades and Persephone fix their rocky relationship that's been throwing the seasons out of order and basically causing a bad time for everyone. As with most retellings, there's some pretty clear immediate differences from the myth. A lot of it's just aesthetic stuff, the musical trades classical Greece for a vaguely post-apocalyptic, Great Depression-inspired setting, but some of the changes feel more fundamental. First of all, Eurydice has, like, narrative agency now. Neat. Secondly, and this is probably the boldest difference, Eurydice doesn't die. I mean, metaphorically speaking, she does, but only in the sense that working under unfettered capitalism brings a spiritual death to everyone. But speaking literally, which admittedly is kind of hard when we're talking about a show that embraces metaphor and abstraction to the extent that Hades Town does, she's still alive by the end, doomed to work forever in Hades' factory, but, you know, alive. What this means thematically is that Hades Town is seemingly a paradox, an Orphic narrative that isn't about mortality at all. The central theme of the myth has been completely removed, like the bones from a fish. The narrative and thematic role Death once played in the story is instead replaced by exploitation under capitalism, which, well, you can't really get much more on the nose than that. Especially when the musical keeps bringing back the idea of a metaphorical death again and again. When Eurydice joins the workers of Hades Town, Hermes calls her dead, dead to the world anyway, and the fates sing that a lot of souls have got to die to keep the rust belt rolling. It's a pretty perfect example of what my bestie Julie was talking about, with classics giving the people who adapt them a common language with which to communicate their ideas. The anti-Little Women 2018, if you will. It takes one of the most famous stories about death and uses its cultural associations as a shorthand to make a point about contemporary political issues. The underworld becomes a handy metaphor for exploitative working conditions in modern day society. Orpheus's perilous descent to a place where he doesn't belong becomes an analogue for immigration. Hell, earlier versions of the show were even more on the nose about it. Before writer Aeneas Mitchell even conceived of the name Hades Town, one lyric went, you either get to hell or a border town, ain't no difference anymore. Obviously, none of these themes were present in the mythology of a culture predating industrialization by a couple thousand years, but as I explained in the beginning, this classic story can absolutely take on these new ideas as time passes. Another thing that sets Hades Town apart from other retellings of this myth is that it's very meta. It leans hard on the fact that this story has been retold so many times, and in fact incorporates it into its narrative. See, Hades Town does this clever thing where it makes the fact that they're doing this eight times a week the whole framing device of the story. The story is narrated by Orpheus' ally slash friend slash father figure slash it's complicated and depends on what production you're talking about, Hermes. Hermes acts as a kind of master of ceremonies for the whole thing, and in the end, when Orpheus has turned around and everything seems hopeless, Hermes is the one who comes in and reminds us of what he told us at the beginning, that although this is a sad tale, a tragedy, they're still going to sing it again. Everything resets. The stage is returned to how it was set up at the beginning of the show. The rest of the company come on stage in the costumes they were wearing at the beginning. Hermes reintroduces all the characters he'd introduced us to at the start. And Orpheus and Eurydice, seemingly doomed to be torn apart forever, see each other for the first time once more. There's kind of no words to describe how it feels to see this in action. Tragic and hopeful and melancholy and redemptive all at once. It's one thing for a musical to acknowledge the existence of repeat performances in the text, but the nature of Hades Town as an adaptation adds so many more layers to it, because we really do always sing it again, again and again and again all throughout the history of art. This framing device is really just a literalization of the process of retelling and reiterating a story. Much like Little Women in its current form, Hades Town is a time loop. It's more blatant about it, but it's the same basic principle. Little Women's loop begins with four sisters together at Christmas. Hades Town's begins, as the lyrics from the off-Broadway production put it, with a young man down on bended knee. Little Women's loop ends with the four sisters either married or dead. Again, pin. There's a pin in that. And Hades Town ends with 
well, it ends as it began, doesn't it? A young man down on bended knee. And just like Little Women, the loop repeats again and again in the desperate hope that maybe things will turn out differently this time. It seems fitting, really. As Hermes puts it in the last song of the show, isn't that what Orpheus would do? Wouldn't the man who descended to the underworld to bring the woman he loved back from the dead want us to keep trying, even when trying itself seems pointless? It also feels particularly apt that Hades Town is the Orphic retelling to introduce this concept of the story of the time loop, because in addition to being yet another iteration of the myth, Hades Town has also iterated on itself many times. Oh, it's a real rabbit hole getting into Hades Town. You start off with the Broadway version and think, oh, this seems cool, and then your friend who you were talking to about it tells you that actually the off Broadway version was so much better, so you track down a live recording of it, and then you find out about the Edmonton and London production that happened in between and the original concept album that, as it turns out, wasn't even the first incarnation of Hades Town because it was based on a small-scale theatre production Mitchell was part of that toured in Vermont and Massachusetts in 2006, but now it's this huge production of a US national tour, which is the same book as Broadway, but a completely different cast who all have their own spin on the characters. Yeah, it's a lot. The different incarnations of Hades Town are fascinating in their own right. The show had a pretty interesting and unique journey from off-Broadway to Broadway. Most of the time, when a show transfers from off-Broadway to either Broadway or another prestigious location, usually the West End, it will receive a few tweaks. Some songs might be cut, some might be added, the lyrics of some might be edited, but the meat of the show will usually remain consistent. The creative team behind Hades Town took a very, very different approach. If you compare the track lists, as it were, for Off-Broadway and Broadway Hades Town, they appear at first glance to be almost exactly the same, aside from a couple of songs being switched around and the closing song I Raise My Cup getting retitled We Raise Our Cups. But when you listen to the two, you'll find that almost every song received at least minor changes to the lyrics, and a lot were completely overhauled. The two versions of Any Way the Wind Blows bear no resemblance to each other beyond the tune and the titular line. Instead of having just a few changes made to improve the characterization or pacing, Hades Town was transformed into an entirely different show. At least in terms of themes and atmosphere and characterization of the two leads, it's hard to even compare. I could say so much about the evolution of Hades Town and how the off-Broadway and Broadway versions compare to each other. Honestly, I'm eyeing it up as a potential topic for a future video, but don't hold me to that. There's the way that the show adapted to match its increasing scale, going from playing in a theatre so small that Orpheus and Eurydice would literally walk through the audience during their ascent from the underworld at the end, to a huge audacious Broadway show with a stage that opened up in front of the audience's eyes. There's the way that Orpheus' entire characterization was fundamentally altered in basically every production, going from brash, outspoken musician with a revolutionary streak, to dust bowl farm boy, to naive boy ingenue with his head stuck firmly in the clouds. There's the addition of the chorus of Hades Town's workers that turns the horrors of its exploitation from abstract to brutally present on stage, and makes Orpheus and Eurydice's attempted ascent symbolic of the greater uprising against the powers that be and the system that keeps people trapped in Hades Town. But at the end of the day, the specifics of the changes are less important to my point here than their very existence. It's the fact that Hades Town has been rewritten and reinvented and reiterated so many times, it's that fact in itself that makes the inevitable ending so much more painful and the show so much more hopeful. Because when you think about it, don't all these changes have to mean something? If the characters' personalities can change as drastically as Orpheus's does from off-Broadway to Broadway, if the words the characters speak can change, if the very song that convinces Hades to give the young lovers a chance can change, then surely, surely the ending can too, right? But it's not just the changes between different versions of Hades Town that create this feeling, it's the infinite number of infinitesimal changes that take place night after night within every individual production. Even exactly the same cast can't recreate each performance perfectly every time. In every single performance, the small expressions, inflections, and movements of the actors will be different. Every single performance slightly subtly different. And every single time, that question looms large over the whole thing. What if this time there could be a happy ending? What if this altered line, this subtle change to a character, this minuscule change in inflection is the flapping butterfly wing that changes everything? And Hades Town achieves this by tapping into the very thing that makes live theatre special. Its uniqueness, its inherent transience. Hades Town takes full advantage of its medium in this sense, weaving the inherent qualities of theatre into its narrative and themes to make the tragedy hurt just that little bit more. But theatre's not alone as a medium in allowing for these kinds of meta twists on classic tales. Film adaptations can employ them just as effectively. It's time for us to take out some pins. Like its predecessors, the 2019 Little Women faces off against the challenge of the ending. The film's solution to audiences' dissatisfaction with Jo's romance and lack of closure to her writing ambitions is elegant in its simplicity. It builds on the prior iterations, which had Joe's story end with writing an in-universe version of Little Women, and takes it to the next step. 
The in-universe version of the book becomes a framing device that recontextualizes the whole story, and the romance with Professor Bayer is implied to be a story Joe makes up as part of her book, as opposed to an actual diegetic event. Like the ending of the original book, this subverts our expectations about how romantic arcs in fiction should play out, but unlike the book, it does it in a way that I, at least, find to be narratively satisfying. And also it doesn't do the thing works of fiction sometimes do, where they hastily pair up all the surviving characters right before the end, which I personally think always sucks. So thanks, Greta! Now, what the 2019 film does to the ending of Little Women is arguably the boldest change any mainstream adaptation has ever made to the story. It seems almost sacrilegious to rewrite the ending of a classic like this. In the past, they've sort of justified this from the perspective of, well, Louisa May Alcott didn't even want Jo to get married, so in a way this is just honouring her original intent. But now, in my old age, I realise that even if it wasn't following Alcott's original intent, well, to be blunt, I just don't care. This is the fourth major film adaptation of a story that's 150 years old. Why should it be completely beholden to its source material? If I wanted an adaptation that keeps the book ending, which frankly I don't, I'd watch one of the 200 other adaptations that don't change it. It's more interesting to consider the film's own individual vision and intent, and how well it executes that. Adaptation is a legitimate form of artistic expression and deserves to be judged as such. I think it's a mistake to act as if retellings can ever be neutral. Adaptations aren't just a way to transfer an existing story to a new medium, they always pick stuff up along the way, even unintentionally. Remember my summary of Little Women at the beginning of this video? I deliberately told it in such a way as to emphasise the melancholy aspects of the story, framing it as a tragedy. Why did I tell it like that? I did it for a reason, to communicate an emotion that the story makes me feel. Contrast that with my summary of the Orpheus and Eurydice myth, which I kept short, simple and vague. Why did I tell it like that? Well, it was partially for reasons of practicality. I had a lot of ground I wanted to cover in this video, and I didn't want to get bogged down in summarising one of my case studies and waste time I could be spending making actual points. But I also did it to convey the malleability of the story, and the diversity of different ways it can be interpreted. Even in just summarising the plot, arguably the simplest form of adapting a story, I'm still making decisions, trying to convey as best I can what I see as important about that story. Adaptations? Retellings? At the end of the day, what are these things but tools by which we can communicate to others what we saw in a work of art? Aeneas Mitchell looked at the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice and saw a tribute to the importance of hope in the face of despair, and a metaphor for contemporary political issues. Greta Gerwig looked at Little Women and saw a melancholy meditation on the loss of childhood, and an open-hearted celebration of the different paths people can take in life. We all see unique things in art, and we all have unique tools by which we can communicate what we see. I'm doing it right now through the process of writing and recording and editing this video essay. Other people might do it by writing reviews, or creating fan art or fan fiction, or posting a reaction video, are those, are those still a thing? The only relevant difference between me and Greta Gerwig is that instead of deciding to make a YouTube video essay about her little women feelings, she decided to write and direct a whole movie about them. So. Here I am, communicating to you how this film and how the story as a whole make me feel. Little Women, as Be Kind Rewind puts it in their excellent video, is a complicated text. It's one I have a very complicated relationship with, and I don't think I'm the only one. I think a lot of people, queer and neurodivergent people especially, have a complicated relationship with the book Little Women, because we can see ourselves so clearly in it, but at the same time, the things that Jo is portrayed as needing to grow out of are her gender nonconformity, and her seeming lack of attraction to men, and her very, very strongly coded neurodivergence. It's the very things that make her like us, and that's a lot to deal with. The book is old, old enough that I can forgive a lot of the cultural values it upholds. But at the risk of sounding way too harsh, and please remember that, again, I am just one guy communicating how a piece of art, or a bunch of different pieces of art in this case, made me feel, I find it a lot harder to forgive the newer adaptations. Adaptations like the 1994 film and the stage musical and the 2017 miniseries are very explicitly treating the text from a modern perspective, looking back with the benefit of our modern day hindsight, and highlighting the sexism and social issues of the time. And with that context, I can't help but feel like it's kind of taking the piss to say, oh, it sure was bad that women in the 19th century had so few options and didn't have a choice in whether or not they got married, or even usually who they married, but it's fine, because Jo decides she actually does want to get married in the end. Yay! Because, well, it's not fine, is it? Because this was a world that real people lived in, and not all of them would have decided that they actually did want to get married after all. Not all of them would have even had that option. I know for a fact that I would have been one of those people. 
And speaking as one of those people, well, not to sound corny, but seeing the new little women back at the beginning of 2020, seeing Jo fight to live as her authentic self and lead the life she wants to, and seeing her win in the end, finding a way in a world that rejects her existence, it meant the world to me. It gave me hope for my own future. If Jo March could do it in a world where women were allowed barely any options to even financially support themselves, surely I could too. If the greater urtext of Little Women represents a time loop, then Little Women 2019 feels like the breaking of that loop. Like, it's kind of hard for me to imagine where adaptations of Little Women are even going to go from this point. It feels like asking what would happen if Groundhog Day or Palm Springs continued after the characters escaped their time loops. Fellow Town fans, you know what I'm talking about here. We all say we wish Orpheus wouldn't turn around at the end, but we don't really want that. Because if Orpheus didn't turn around, that would break the loop. There'd be no more Hades Town. And I don't want to live in a world where there's no more Hades Town before I even get a chance to see it in person. Fuck that. To be clear, I don't actually want there to be no more Little Women adaptations or retellings after this. What I actually think I want is for the Little Women retellings of the future not to fall back in the loop. I want them to stop retreading the same ground and move forward. Works like Hades Town prove the power of the classics, but only as long as the people retelling them have unique ideas and visions that they want to explore through these works. Even though there are of course reasons why certain works might be considered timeless or classics, and it's always interesting to think about why, I don't think that means that art can remain timeless all on its own. If these works are going to remain in the cultural consciousness, it's vital that they can be interpreted by new voices, who can draw out things about them that make them relevant to modern day, and interrogate the values that the works adopted from their original time periods. Make weird adaptations! Write retellings that would make the original author roll in their grave! Make that stupid sci-fi dystopian version of Little Women! Will this guarantee good results? Absolutely not! That sci-fi dystopian version of Little Women would probably be very bad. But allowing these stories to evolve will have interesting results. It will have honest results, and maybe that matters even more. Above all else, I love Gerwig's Little Women because it is a deeply honest vision that makes some very bold swings to the fences. We can speculate all we want about what Gerwig's main reason for making the leaps she did and changing the ending was. Maybe it was for feminist reasons, or for wanting to honour Alcott's original intent reasons, or just for straight up believing it was truer to the character reasons. But to me personally, as someone who has been Joe, who has been that kid who felt painfully different from everyone around them, that kid who walked through life constantly wondering why they didn't have the feelings for people they knew they should, for me, more than anything, it feels like grace. It feels like grace in the same way that Orpheus not turning around would be grace. It's a moment not just of respite, but of transfiguration. A moment when a story that for so long was about one thing is transformed into a story about another. It becomes a different vision of the world, a kinder one, maybe. It's stepping forward instead of repeating the decisions of the past over and over again. I find it strangely comforting to know that in the urtext of Little Women, the greater canon that transcends any one version, Joe isn't like the young lovers of Hades Town, doomed to stay stuck in the same cycle. Through the minds of so many different creators, she gets to live a hundred different lives, and finally gets a different ending, gets to move on to a new stage of the story instead of returning to the same old one. She gets the thing that Hermes hopes for. It does turn out this time. The final lines of Gerwig's screenplay read, Joe looks up and sees the future. I think in that moment I did too.